They signed us up with a whaling crew for the icy Greenland ground. They said we'd take a shorter way. Well, we was outward bound, brave boy. Well, we was outward bound. Oh, the lookout up in the barrel stood with a spyglass in his hand. There's a whale, there's a whale, there's a whale, he cried. And she blows at every stand, brave boys. And she blows at every stand. The captain stood on the quarter deck, the ice was in his eye. Overhaul, overhaul, let your down the tackles fall. And put your boats to sea, brave boys, and put your boats to sea. Well, the boats got down and the men aboard, and the whale was full in view. Breeze all, breeze all, let these whaler men go. To the sea where the whale fish blew, brave boys, to the sea where the whale fish Hello, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us here today at Penobscot Marine Museum. Please leave your questions and comments below. We love hearing from you. We have in our collection four oil paintings of Dutch whaling ships painted by Joachim de Vries in 1769. The Dutch have a long, fascinating maritime history of exploration, fishing, and a powerful navy. Here in Maine, we have had direct experience of the strength of the Dutch Navy. The Dutch attacked the French fort at Antiboet, Castine, in 1674 and held Penobscot Bay for a couple of years. This is the ship De Vries. Dutch whalers fished for bowhead whales in the Arctic in the 17th and 18th centuries. Americans, especially from Nantucket and New Bedford, Mass, fished first for right whales and then for sperm whales in the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. And as the whale populations declined from excessive hunting, whaling ships sailed farther and farther afield. A large ship carried a crew and a number of small agile boats. When a whale was sighted, the crew climbed down into the little boats, which you can see they're doing over here. Each boat was considerably smaller than the whales that they were hunting. And then they tried to strike the whale with a harpoon. You can see that over here. There's a guy standing in the whale boat with a harpoon trying to take aim. When a whale was harpooned, it would attempt to flee, dragging the little boat behind it for hours until tiring, whereupon the small boat would row back to the ship, towing the whale carcass with them. The whale's body would be tied beside the ship. The crew would cut off the fatty flesh and cook the pieces down to get out the oil. Early whaling vessels would bring the whale back to staging on land where they did the boiling. Later ships carried triworks on board, which allowed them to stay out for sometimes as long as three years, processing each whale into oil as they killed it until the holds were a big, huge cooperage barrels of oil. This next painting is of the ship Europa. A whale is being harpooned again in the back over here. A walrus is hooking its head up above the water. We have a whale's tail coming up out of the water over here. These birds look like razor bills, which is a kind of auk, the lesser auk. Uh, the greater auk is extinct, but these are the lesser auks and they, they still are around. We've all heard about endangered whales. Take a guess as to what time period this next quote is from. 
We hear from the towns on the Cape that the whale fishery among them has failed much this winter, as it has done for several winters past. That is the Boston newsletter from all the way back in 1720. So as early as then, they had already fished out nearby waters and were having to travel farther and farther to get whales. So when Melville wrote, wrote Moby Dick in 1851, he was trying to preserve the history of something that was already starting to pass by. Of course, it didn't stop them from continuing to try to get every last whale all the way up through the 20th century. Uh, but by the end of the 19th century, in addition to bowhead whales, humpback, gray, and right whales were nearly extinct. After years of working to protect right whales, there are today about 400 still living. Uh, the walrus too in this painting was another animal that was killed by sailors. Walruses can grow to over 4,000 pounds, but they didn't bother to eat the meat or anything. They just wanted the tusks were sought after for ivory and the walruses came near to extinction in the 19th century. They didn't have the internet in the 1700s, so artists often had to rely on a picture that someone else drew to know what something looked like. So this is a little funny looking, but I think that this is a gray whale, and this is the baleen that they strain huge gulps of water through filling up on tiny plankton, uh, many different kinds of tiny little sea creatures. And then the, this is the piece of baleen. Baleen was used for stiffening in corsets and ribs of umbrellas. Uh, but what they wanted most was the oil, like we were talking about earlier. Like other intelligent animals, young whales stay with their moms for years, learning how to find food, learning how to communicate and thrive in a social structure. Pods of 20 or so female and young whales st stick together and share the responsibility of raising the young whales. A few whales did protect themselves, and at least three whale ships were destroyed by a whale attack. The whale ship Essex is the famous one. It sunk in about 10 minutes after two very strategic strikes by a male sperm whale. This ship is the Hrunlandia. I enjoy how each painting has a different Arctic animal featured. All of these paintings are very tall and long, which would, would have looked very nice next to each other um, up on pen old walls in the 18th century. There are uh, some men climbing down into boats over here, a man with a spear, they're rowing. The Dutch hunted whales near Greenland for centuries, up until uh, the mid 19th century. Uh, the artist who painted these paintings, uh, De Vries, was born uh, sometime around 1725 and lived till 1788. He began as a house painter and taught himself uh, marine painting. He lived and worked in Zandam, a whaling port. In 1700, Zandam was a major shipbuilding town with 50 yards, completing 350 ships in a given year. Zandam is just northwest of Amsterdam. Thank you so much for joining us here at Penobscot Marine Museum. Leave your questions and comments below. Many thanks to Bertie, who generously took the time to coach me in the pronunciation of the Dutch names. Sperm whales have teeth instead of baleen. Sperm whales are the largest toothed predators on the planet.
whale's teeth were a byproduct of the fishery. And one pastime for sailors was to engrave a drawing and fill it with ink to bring out the image. Sailors made lots of images of ships, unsurprisingly, but sometimes also images of the women and children that they missed from home. I thought that this picture was an image of a mom and two kids, but I consulted fashion historian Elizabeth Cole Chien, MFAIA, who explained that the person depicted is wearing a shorter skirt. You can see her ankles down here. And this suggests youth. Liz found a number of interesting clues into who this person might be. The sleeve length and collar both support the theory that she's young. Um, and as well, the fact that she has a ribbon in her hair as opposed to a more womanly comb or flower. However, her hair is up and she's wearing earrings. Can you see her? Her hoop earrings there. Uh, those two clues suggest someone older than a girl. So with all of these clues taken together, Liz suggests that this is the eldest girl, perhaps 16 or 17, teaching her two younger siblings. You can see they have a whole stack of, of books here on the table. Sailors also made gifts to bring back the family, uh, such as this uh, puzzle for a child. Scrimshaw was only one of many crafts that sailors were busy making, such as shell work, sewing, carving. Sailors had very little free time, however. Captains were very concerned about idle sailors, and so they kept them very busy six days a week four hours working at a time, four hours sleeping at a time. They were kept busy scraping, scrubbing, painting, and tarring the vessel. This paintings on a whale's tooth is a rare view into the life of the sailor. Most of our records are ship's logs, and letters written by more educated captains and first mates. It's very rare to have a primary source showing everyday life for the regular guys. This painting shows the inside of the forecastle. So that's that cabin that's in the front of the ship where uh, the sailors stay. It's a very unpleasant place it's uh the the front is bouncing the most the back is the most stable so it's the least comfortable place so the low guys on the totem pole are in the forecastle on the whale ship essex all of the guys in front were the african americans so in this image we see sailors uh sitting together each has something that he's working on. This guy looks like he has a harpoon. Perhaps he is sharpening it. There's a man uh, with a ship model in his lap over here. Look at how spare and small the quarters are. A few of them have a trunk for belongings. You can see they're, they're using their trunk to seat. I'm very entertained by the decoration on the bottom of the mask here. A heart with an arrow through it, a ship, a dolphin, an anchor. Can you see back here, there's some men sleeping in their bunks way back here. Very small space. This is the Vredenhof. Boats are working together to tow a whale back to the ship where it will be stripped of blubber. We have a polar bear here. For some people, polar bears have become a symbol of climate change because their environment, which is made of ice, is, is disappearing and melting. What do you think? How urgent is this issue for you? We have, I think, the the best look of all of these paintings at the sailors here you can see some of their hats and coats. 
men who could not get better jobs out in the world often became sailors. Men who could not get a sailor position became whalers. It was not a job most people wanted. The first Nantucket whaling men were Wampanoag, the native people who have been living in Southern Mass for thousands of years and still are. Uh, later on, African Americans filled the void left by the diminishing populations of Native Americans when waves of sickness came through brought by Europeans. Men new to whaling got very poor pay, limited provisions, sometimes not enough food to live on. The job itself was very dangerous and death at sea was a real possibility. This painting is a 20th century imagining of men trying to harpoon a sperm whale. It's painted by Waldo Pierce in 1954. He may have not seen this firsthand, but we do have accounts such as the one from Thomas Nickerson, who sailed out on the whale ship Essex in 1819, describing whale boats getting smashed to pieces, just like in this painting here. You can see there's a poor guy is in the water while they're trying to spear the whale. The song that you heard in the beginning is from Roger McGinn's uh, Folk Den Project, which I highly recommend checking out. He started in 1995 posting recordings and sheet music to his favorite songs, including several sea shanties, but also blues, hymns, British Isles tunes. I really appreciate the project's mission to share these old folk songs. Thank you very much for joining us today at Penobscot Marine Museum. This programming has been brought to you in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities, Exploring the Human Endeavor. Next week, Education Director Gina will bring you a beautiful painting of the Castine waterfront and more by local artist and Penobscot Bay historian, George Wasson. Thanks and take care.